There we go. Okay, we are recording now. Okay, Sarah, do you want to start off or? Sure. Um, so maybe we could do at the start was just to do some quick introductions to kind of see where maybe everyone is and whether, I don't know, experience with AI is how familiar they are with it. If it's something totally new to you, kind of give us a sense of like, you know, I guess where we should be kind of talking. Um, maybe I'll just introduce myself first, I guess, to start. Um, so I am Sarah, I'm a professor of communications and creativity at Memorial University. Uh, and I've been Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, and my research largely focuses on video games, but more so specifically in experimental games. There's a lot of overlap there with obviously digital literature uh, and things like that. So I've been kind of working on uh, a research creation project involved in um, making critical games that critique the implementation, implementation of AI in society by also using these technologies and incorporating them into that. And I think I'll, I'll demo some of that maybe um, at the end of, uh, I guess, my section of this talk. I'll be focusing mostly on text generation, but Patrick, do you want to maybe introduce yourself? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Patrick Wick. I'm an uh, assistant professor of mass communication at uh, uh, Winona State University, which is a bit of a ALO hotbed. And um, let's see here. I've been a uh, new media artist, theorist, and uh, investigator of, uh, of um, digital writing for about 30, 30 years. Um, some of you might know some of my work as uh, the uh, animator of the activist group, The Yes Men. Uh, I've been also um, a performance artist in Second Life with, um, uh, I had a group called uh, Second Front. And um, let's see here. Um, I have a couple of books out, one called Variant Analyses, which is um, uh, at the Institute for Network Cultures. Um, and for the most part, a lot of my work has to do, a lot of my general work has to do with the notion of uh, mediation and its and its uh, effect on our notion of, of, of reality and its effects on society. And um, let's see here. Um, I think anything else I think I I think that's good for now okay uh maybe we can try to go around the room somehow I don't yeah, know if that we would can be use, great. like participant order or something feel free to call on people yeah or in the spirit of the unconference if nobody says anything you can keep going um but I I do I'm looking so forward to this workshop because I want to learn more about AI and generative text and I also want to be absolved because I've fallen in love with Midjourney. And I'm using that to create the hundred more illustrations that I need in my book. So absolve me of my guilt for AI. You you are you 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 are forgiven because what basically what happens is is that um um about I've done a couple probably a couple thousand images in mid journey and it's my it's my poison of choice actually so well and and actually the one thing i think that might be, actually be really good is to um and actually um i'm doing a exhibition called uh, beyond the selfie and that sort of thing that's uh, hopefully going to be up by beginning of february that is based around lenza so the thing is, is that, you know, if we're, uh, if, yeah, if, if, uh, if, if we're going to be talking about things critically, we should be going and talking to them, looking at, looking at the beast straight in the face. So, of course. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. Christine, what's your uh what's your involvement with this stuff, if anything? Um, well, I haven't worked with AI at all, as far as I remember. Um, I uh create my own electronic literature. Um <clears throat> awesome. and I, I work with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I used to work with Flash. Um 
So I, I don't know anything. Well, I know a little bit about AI, but I haven't used, not in a practical sense, I haven't used it. Good to see you, Mr. Zlaznikar. So. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, nice to be back. <clears throat> I've been here before and I had to jump off for a second. Uh, I did, uh, I have some uh, experience uh, with AI. I prompted like most of it that's available. I also found some that also enables you to do uh, to bypass the <clears throat> usual filters. <clears throat> so you can do field. <laughs> and um, uh, I recently coordinated an exhibition in the museum that I'm working at uh, that uh, involved uh, a very sort of advanced uh, use of uh, chat CGP that was uh, specially trained uh, to Slovene language and then to the subset of the language to produce uh, uh, a certain poetic form of a sonnet out of Twitter. Uh, but that's it. Uh, as, as an author, I didn't delve into that. Mm. Sarah, would... <laughs> Do you think we should just go around and just uh, put everybody on the spot? Uh, does anyone else want to jump in? And I don't, you know. I'll I'll throw in just so that I can continue to be mute. Mute. Um, I I do I do nothing with AI. I played around with Disco Diffusion and Mid Journey, um, and then promptly, uh, as as you can tell, Brain the Bag of Cats got distracted by something else. Uh, but um, I'm really interested in some of the ethical questions about art and 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 what it's using to create these these images and works, whether it's um, sort of implicitly collaborating with other artists that don't know that perhaps they're contributing to it, um, and and some of those questions, those thornier questions. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what comes of this. Hi everyone, um, I'm Maria Menzi and I've been working as well on um, electronic literature for many, many years since before 2000 or something, um, mm -hmm. but I haven't been working with AI and uh, I'm quite interested in see what uh, is coming up of this uh, workshop and try to learn a little bit about this. Hi. Um I'm in the same group as quite a lot of people. I dabbled with uh, Mid Journey when it first came out and then promptly got sidetracked by other things. And I've got to say, I find the whole leap of AI to be able to generate text and stories to be quite scary. So I would love to learn more so it's not so scary. <laughs> Um, I'll just jump in quickly. I've been playing up Dina. I'm like you, I'm like massively. <laughs> I'll say it takes a, a lot of my time, but in the background, uh, I've been playing a lot with mid journey um, and sometimes feeding uh, chat GPT generated narratives into mid journey and back and forth, really inspired by um, Sharon Martin's right with Leica workshop, which is sort of fantastic in terms of, you know, uh, sort of basically feeding AI into each other. Um, also created a sort of a, an elegy memory piece, um, working with mid journey images and currently working on multiple projects, um, particularly around uh, sort of critically thinking about adaptation issues um, in the context of what is like when one start work starts working with prompts like in the style of Wes Anderson, which is so ubiquitous. <laughs> Right. It's like, how do we actually start to critically think about that in the context of adaptation theory, uh, which is another area that I'm working on? Um, obviously, copyright uh, is a huge issue in this space. Um, so um, also thinking about in that context, um, the sort of the early 
uh, disaster of Google Books and the kind of protocols around recognizing living copyright in that context and having your works actually sort of uh, limited from the archive and the pushback from writers at that time and thinking there might be models there. Um, so um, anyway, sort of very, very active with it, but there's always so much to just catch up on learn and learn more about um, with it. So happy, very happy to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's hear Jessica Francie. Hi, I'm Jessica. I am a, a poet and I write e-poetry. And last year, as part of an incubator in digital literature, uh, I wrote poetry fragment, poetry fragments with a Mexican poet. And I've entered these fragments into Pixray, which is an AI image generator. I was really impressed and surprised by the results. I mean, how do you come up with an image for the sadness of longing or the colorful moon or the situation of the dance? The results were fantastic. And, you know, you put in keywords and then it generates an image in two minutes and the results are fabulous. So I'm looking forward to know more about AI. Francie? Uh, yeah, yes, I no, I, I'm not working in AI, uh, but I experimented and I, yeah, uh, try to find out how it works and it's it's quite a daunting thought that what's going to um, happen with creative writing. Uh, I used to uh, teach creative writing and uh, can you distinguish a first year student or a second language student's work? Um, maybe they used uh, AI, uh, what can you do and how can we work with the students um, to, to uh, not to, to um, uh, um, tell them they may not use it because it's part of the world and the future world of work. So how can one uh, um, give them the tools to work with them without losing their own creativity and only giving it their tasks and yet they work over to AI. So that is that is quite a challenge, especially on school um, level as well, C uh, creative writing assignments, whatever. Uh, and, and we won't be able to, to tell the difference in the future because it's only students and it's, it's children trying to to learn a new language. Um, so that is some of the ethical questions I have as well, uh, the creative questions. Mm -hmm. Amy, we're going around and sort of asking, you know, where, where everybody is with AI and what's your interest? Um, me, Amy. Yeah, I assume. Um, I am a researcher, postdoc researcher working at Bath Spa University and lots of, um, I'm just really interested in AI in particular around um, kind of creative applications and how you might be able to collaborate or write with AI uh, to produce creative work. Um, that's something that's part of a research project that I'm working on at the moment um, at Bath Spa University. Mm. Uh, yeah, so super interested, really enjoying kind of experimenting with with, um, with various um, programs and things, trying to work out the creative applications. Super. Anybody else? Is it uh, um, Christine? Hi, sorry, I'm eating because I'm in Singapore and it's dinner time. <laughs> but um, I run a digital storytelling studio and we work in the intersection of like uh, digital literature, but also art and technology and things like that. So I was kind of curious about the kind of work that would be showcased here and just kind of, I used to do a master's in adaptation. So <laughs> I was kind of curious about like getting back into the more academic side of things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, all, all do we, it, only, only person we have left is, uh, Johanna, maybe? 
Is that uh, what what you're interested in? What's your interest in uh, AI, Johanna? Okay, maybe there's a. Okay, so uh, I'm just here to learn. Pardon me. Okay, but what's that? Oh, Nan uh, sir, uh, Nancy, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm just here to listen and learn. Okay. Um, everybody covered. Okay. Right, so I, uh, maybe started talking about the, I guess the text generation stuff first, and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Go, go ahead. Go, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, we. Uh, that's. Um, I think that's what we uh, talked about in our meeting. Yeah. So. Yeah. Go right on ahead. Okay. I'm just gonna share my screen here. So I think you see that. Um, yeah, so I, I just thought what I would do is kind of open by uh, talking a bit about uh, the context of the implementation of uh, AI generated text, uh, some of the imaginations kind of around how it could be used, how we you know, kind of think about sort of this technology, um, and also how I've used this technology in my own creative work. Uh, and of course, it's really hard to you know, think about you know, text generation uh, without, you know, going back to do why some of Eliza, right, the chatbot therapist. Um, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Eliza, uh, which is an early bot that was modeled after a Rogerian psychotherapist uh, that essentially engaged anyone who interacted with it in a dialogue of a kind of self-discovery uh, by uh, essentially reframing any kind of user input as questions. Uh, and there's lots of great stories uh, and mythologies about how people were interacting with this system and you know how some people believed it was a real person uh, or the you know the secretary thought that it was a device for communicating with somebody or graduate students there wanting to tell it its secrets and things like that. Um, happened to my screen there. Uh, so I have, you know if anyone was interested in, uh, taking a look at Eliza or seeing how it works, there's an example that you can use that I just put into the chat there. But uh, yeah, so, you know, obviously this is a popular example. Um, but again, this was, you know, 1966, so a lot has kind of changed since then. Uh, this wasn't especially sophisticated. Uh, there were lots of kind of great mythologies about, you know, again, how people were interacting with this, but Mostly what it was doing was really, it was good at identifying parts of speech and kind of reframing those as a question. So it might be, uh, you know, tell me about your troubles. And you'd say, well, I had a bad day. And I would say, why did you have a bad day? And you would say, well, I had a fight with my mother. And say, you know, well, tell me about why this fight with your mother was bad or something, right? And it would just kind of reframe your questions in that kind of way to interact with it. Um, today, obviously, we're dealing with much more sophisticated systems with these large language models that you've probably heard of in the news. A lot of you mentioned that, uh, GPT and things like that. Um, and these language models um, have changed even quite a bit over the last just several years. Uh, the first kind of, I think, one that was the most sort of, uh, and again, you kind of pick up in the news was GPT-2, uh, which was a program that was used to uh, generate text that worked very much like predictive text on your phone, um, but a bit more extensive, where it would essentially you know, give a prompt and fill in what it thought would come next from that. So, generation. Uh, and now we are, you know, obviously at the times of Chat GPT, um, which is technically, I guess, uh, a more sophisticated version of that. It's kind of also instead of being more prompt based, it's kind of uh, based, like it tries to actually talk back and forth uh, to different people. Or, sorry, I tried to see, sorry, I'm looking at the chat, I see there's stuff coming up in the chat. Uh, but it tries to have a conversation with you kind of about whatever 
uh, you ask it, you could ask it for recipes, you could ask it for how to fix your code or something like that. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of different things that you can do. So obviously, you know, it's a huge improvement over Eliza, um, but it still struggles with, you know, sometimes just remembering what it wrote uh, because it was trained on uh, databases from the internet. Another kind of issue that it has is, of course, that it maintains a lot of the same stereotypes and biases that we find. Uh, so I have here just uh, a screenshot of kind of the GPT uh, chat window that you see now if you were to go there today. You know, tells you you know some of its capabilities that it you know, it's, it's much better than say. Uh, it also allows you user to provide follow up uh, corrections. So like if you ask it something and it, you're not sure what its answer is, you can of course follow up on that and ask it for clarity. Uh, and this is where, you know, this is the software that's been going around where we've been having these discussions about you know, concerns about whether or not students are going to use this for cheating. Uh, I had a discussion in my class yesterday where a student was concerned that we might use this technology for grading their essays, which I thought was um, quite funny. <laughs> uh, I don't know how well that would work if GPT could possibly assign grades to, to essays. But the idea that students would be handing in essays that they didn't write that we'd be grading uh, using the same technology is. Uh, it's kind of uh, so there are, have also been other kinds of interesting sort of uh, thinking about sort of of this technology, uh, and I saw someone put a Steam link in the chat, so I'm wondering if it was this game, perhaps that someone put in there. Uh, so this was uh, a. 2019. I suspect that that's what was in the chat. It's hard to follow that. Yep, um, yep, sure that okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a fictional game essentially about a future where uh, counseling is advised by an AI um, and it's mediated through a human actor. So the, the person who's speaking to, let's say, a client or patient um, is not trained in any way in you know psychology, but they have an AI kind of speaking in their ear that they just sort of you know read whatever they say. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, one possible sort of future that we've kind of had about this technology. Um, but this raises all kinds of ethical questions, right? Because although this game kind of seems, you know, far off in the future or something like that, uh, we have actually been implementing AI in society in very similar and uh, dangerous ways, I would argue. Uh, so an example that I have is from Amy Lippold's book, oh, We Are Data, uh, which examines and thoroughly criticizes the use of algorithms in AI uh, in medical settings. Uh, he offers the example of Mark Hemmings, who is a 41-year-old uh, British disabled man who called 999 or 911. An ambulance three separate times. He's denied an ambulance, uh, and later he dies of a heart attack. Um, so then we have this kind of quotation here from the book where it says the series of questions the emergency operator asked came straight from an algorithmic triage system. So he calls in and presents his systems uh, and the operator rather than using their human judgment has some sort of system in front of them where they can check things off uh, to determine whether or not they should actually send an ambulance. And based on his symptoms, the AI denied uh, that service. Uh, and despite his pleading with the with that system rather than kind of maybe taking into account the sort of human element there. So Cheney Lippold goes on to say, uh, yeah, so the, the algorithmic trust system used not to help Hemmings but to discern the urgency of the situation. Hemmings' verbal answers were input. Output was whether an ambulance would be sent based on those answers. With our changes in his symptoms, further action was forbidden. This dependence on algorithmic logic is best summed up with the ludicrous instruction, and this is what the, the 911 operator applied to him with it. If you collapse, become unconscious, unresponsive, faint, cold, or clammy, it's 999. So the operator's own human agency was demoted to a mere algorithmic translation. Here in, in these kinds of implementations, right, they were missing that kind of element that is, you know, obviously 
really important um, and can have tragic results. So I think there's a lot kind of going on here. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, is anyone else having problems hearing? I'm seeing in the chat there was you know the the audio volume. Every once in a while, it gets a little fuzzy. Yes, yeah, um, difficult to hear. Mm. Tiny bit glitchy, but I I can understand it. I can understand it, okay. and I, and hopefully on the recording it will be better because on the recording it will be recording it directly from you. Um, but feel free to post in the chat if you if there's something that you couldn't quite understand that you want to follow up on. Yeah, sorry about that. I've been having some. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, also, um, it's much easier to also have the transcript open as well. So we have it on multiple text channels. Mm. Go for it. Go for it, Sarah. OK, uh, hopefully. Yeah, maybe because it's recorded, my Internet's been a bit poor. So I'm hoping that it will keep it together for the rest of this presentation. Um, yeah, so talking about some of the, the biases and issues that get built into here, obviously the uh, text databases that are used to train things like GPT-3 or, or chat GPT uh, are filled with all kinds of biases uh, because they're you know, drawing on uh, the internet, right? And we'll see this too probably uh, in Patrick's presentation as well. Um, but you know, like if you Google physics professor, right, you get a certain kind of image, right? And we'll see this kind of gender bias emerge in uh, an activity they have for us uh, in just a moment. But yeah, we're seeing you know other implementations of this AI as well, um, like the heavily criticized Compass uh, program algorithm that was used uh, to de detect uh, recidivism rates in people who had committed crimes, whether or not they were likely to commit crimes again. Uh, and although this was being used. They found that uh, it was no better at predicting crimes with random people, right? So they kind of showed these profiles to other people that, you know, it was, it was just as good as basically random chance. Uh, and it was much more likely to determine that people of color were more likely to you know, commit crimes and it would deny them opportunities for parole. And, um, and part of this, right, was because of the, uh, some of the questions that they asked on this form were, you know, obviously heavily biased and things like that. Uh, the data that they had about people who were likely to recommit crimes was, you know, biased. So an example here on the, the survey would ask if a, if a hungry person had the right to steal. Um, and then we have this situation where this is all you know, driven by statistics and we have, you know, so-called dirty data uh, that's informing these AI, right? So the, it's, supposedly drawing on stats and therefore it should be, you know, something that is uh, neutral or unbiased, but these stats that they're using completely lost, lack nuance and any kind of consideration of the complexities of, of people's situations. Um, yeah. So other implementations of AI that we've seen too are things like facial recognition, right? This kind of software and how well it can uh, detect you know, people of color has been a major issue. Uh, and this was something here in Canada uh, where the RCMP had been using this software um, and they kept denying that they were using it. Uh, for many months. Um, then they were saying that they would limit its use uh, but won't stop using it entirely. All right, so we have police forces, you know, drawing on this technology. Um, that's known to be very biased and would, you know, falsely identify people um, and bring them in. Uh, and I mention this because it's a, an important example to um, the work that we kind of at the end of this, but yeah. Uh, eventually, Clearview AI uh, was essentially banned in Canada. Uh, so we have the Office of the Privacy Commissioner uh, statement saying that they are ceasing to in Canada, uh, which is good, but it is still uh, in operation in other places. So I want to then, I guess, kind of move on to thinking about uh, kind of getting back, I guess, to the conference theme, right? And this idea of like uh, using digital literature for 
social good and um, you know we're thinking about digital literature that's drawing on this kind of you know text-based exchange uh, this kind of example would be something like facade which is something that I'm sure many of you have mm -hmm. come across um, you know a popular example where you can like type into the game right and it responds um, to what you're speaking about and or tries to uh, it's a lot of fun if you can you still have a computer that will run on um, a more recent example of something kind of similar is AI Dungeon. Uh, and AI Dungeon, at least the free version that you can use, uh, runs off of GPT-2. So this is the version of GPT that's not great at remembering what you wrote initially. Um, and it is still you know, trained on a lot of these kinds of problematic text databases, very drawn on writing from the internet. So this is from AI Dungeon, uh, their website, it says, AI Dungeon is just the beginning. Our vision is to use AI to revolutionize the systems that are made. AI will enable games that are alive and dynamic where your actions impact the world in significant ways. And where, sorry, and where you are not bound by the imaginations of the developers who created them, which I think is really interesting, this idea that this technology to allow players to, you know, create their own kinds of narratives, right? Rather than, you know, being subject to, um, you know, an artist or a writer, uh, it's just, you can make whatever story you want, right? So in a sense, you know, anything is kind of possible in these worlds. Um, so this raises some questions for me that I was just kind of thinking about, what does it mean to play a story that can be whatever you want? Uh, what kinds of stories will be told themselves, and also what's the purpose of art? Right? Because it seems like that kind of human connection element uh, is important. So maybe these are questions that we can kind of get to uh, in a minute. But uh, yeah, when we're interacting with this space, something that I, I want to kind of touch on too, right, is that it talks about anything is possible literally anything uh, and either it's kind of warning I guess about uh, the database that it's drawing on uh, and it says that uh, that you might encounter some weird quirks that you you know you might notice as you're interacting with this um, and I think the biggest weird quirk that I kind of came across in using this was that um, it's really hard anything is possible except for women tends to exclude women, which I found really interesting in using this. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of messing around with this the other day and some of the things that I came up with when interacting with it, this was stuff that it said. Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't remember exactly what like the context for these kinds of shifts as you, as you interact with it. Mm. But it said something like, oh, we have a few female technicians, but they're in the kitchen or something. And it leads you to an elevator, right? So you can kind of hear, right? Like some of those, like you know, internet jokes and things that it's kind of picked up on. Um, this was one student where I was uh, interacting in like a university classroom in this narrative or something, and it said the professor is a thing, and I said, no, the professor is a woman. The professor is a man who thinks he is a woman or something, and then I asked something about how many students are are women in the class. And this is the only response are from students who don't answer. None you say, well, that's a shame. Why is that a shame? One asked angrily. And then the other, uh, he laughs, I'm a woman. This must have been something that I put in there. And it says, ah, oh, got it. Well, I was looking for a doctor. And then the last one, uh, I don't know, they just happened. Mm, I like this girl, you think to yourself, you turn around and see a girl with long blonde hair wearing a pink top and shorts, right? So again, we have these kinds of typical images and things like that. Um, so what I wanted to kind of do, I guess, as a group was to uh, experiment with this technology. I set up a, a multiplayer room for us to kind of look at text generation. So you'll be able to uh, add to the story and I have kind of set up a context about AI and society for this. Um, so I'll paste this into the chat just so that it's a link. 
Um, so when you click on the, the link, there is a code that you enter. Uh, and then you'll see at the bottom that you'll be able to change it from, there we go, that's in the chat now. Um, so you can also copy that code and put that in. So click multiplayer, type in that code or copy and paste it in. Um, and you can sort of change the mode from either you can add to the film, you can say what you see or what you do or what you say. So where should we be in it? Uh, so if you follow the, yeah. Yeah, so if you follow the link and then you uh -huh. click on multiplayer. So if you see here, it's and enter the F7 TDTQ. Yeah. Quick start. Yep, yeah, I should have hit join. Ah, play. So see when you're here, you can change this. So feel free to uh, type in whatever. I I get a whole bunch of um, names like Fiomar, Bethesdas, Gorgon. Should I be getting something different? Can I see what uh, we should, should be getting? Yeah, so once you click join, it should ask you your name mm -hmm. um, and then you can type in. So the context that I set up, it says we're living in a world dominated by artificial intelligence. It controls the justice system, policing and education. You are a human professor at a university in a major city. Today is the first day of classes. Your first course to teach is AI in society. You hope to train students to subvert the AI bureaucracy by seeking out weaknesses in the AI that disrupt its logic. So then the AI have started writing, uh, you believe that people are capable of doing this. You hope to show them how you unlock the door to your classroom and prepare to enter. Uh, what will you do? <laughs> Sorry, I just saw what uh, what you <laughs> wrote. That was really interesting. Again, they are all men except for one woman. <laughs> wow. <laughs> First, look more like a fight. Right, as soon as there's too many women in the class, it's a feminist rally now. That's great. Nice. <laughs> Oh, interesting. I'm surprised it's first. Uh, yeah, I don't know why it struggles so much. I'm really kind of uncomfortable with the taste of a blackberry here. <laughs> yeah, that made me uncomfortable as well. I'm like, wait a minute. Oh, that's really strange. What was strange, Patrick? No, the BlackBerry, and then. Oh. Yeah. But, but but it's interesting. I, I was I was looking at the idea of like you know how many, you know uh, I was kind of looking at things from a, a post-human kind of perspective, like you know how many 
you know, how many non-humans there were and saying that there are a couple of couple of gray rabbits and some reptiles. And the thing is, is that, you know, the, the, there's nothing that you would imagine as overly fantastic. Mm -hmm. At least it has a few non-human characters, but it's interesting. The biases show up right away. Yeah. They, they yeah, do. Yeah, don't this know. is what I found. See, that's one thing I wonder about, you know, if, if these technologies become, you know, become uh, really dominant in our society, then, you know, what sort of hegemonies are they going to evoke? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the problem. I think uh, uh, Mark Kokelberg talks about this in his book uh, on AI, but uh, the problem of AI mirroring the data. And it's a question of, you know, do we want to uh, use the data as it is to kind of reflect the world as it sort of really is based on, you know, what happens online? Um, or do we want to edit that data uh, to make it, you know, make the world a better place than it is? Um, and what happens is that then that kind of opens up the question of like, well, who's manipulating this data and how are they going to manipulate it? If, you know, we don't have a good track record of um, having the right people kind of in control of these kinds of programs. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's kind of an interesting problem to sort of bad either way. In a sense, it's always like that, though, because who's going to say who the right people are? Exactly. Well, well, well. It's going to be a little facetious. Well, you, Alan. <laughs> no, no, it's really a lot worse than that. And there's another implicit bias that I'm very concerned about. And yes. that is how many people have the time and the access to play with this. Um, there are so many people, even Francie right now is going through a um, black, rolling blackout. Who owns the computers uh, in the US? If you are under the poverty line and you've got two kids, you're working three jobs. You're barely sleeping. You're not going to be adding to this database. And those are the people that we're missing. And we we can't even know what we're not we're, what we're not getting. Well, half my family is in Iran. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Let alone the political aspects of. Uh, China's internet or anything else. Yeah, exactly. So how do we get those biases yeah. apparent? If, if I may for a moment, there was, um, uh, there was, uh, I was in a talk with someone who was talking about web three and and using AR, you know, AI and AR headsets and, and that sort of thing to, you know, in a empower everybody and and you know put everybody in this new world and all that sort of thing. And I and I said I said who is this for? And he says everybody. I said well, you know, being that I I had many different friends of many different stripes. You know, when I was living in Dubai, I said you know I, I have a very good friend who who runs a fish farm in south of Dhaka in Bangladesh. I said how about him? And he said I'll get back to you on that. And I said I thought so. You don't even have to look farther than God. Come to Providence and go down a street here and see the homeless people who are sleeping oh. in doorways down here. And uh, some of them have cell phones, but there, it's a population that's completely left out of this. It's right oh, here. Okay. It's right here. It's everywhere. Of course. Yeah. So I think and it's uh, just in the. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry, but it. Uh, my point too was not only are they not playing, they're not visible. They're not included right. in the database, and that's a problem. Yeah, but sorry, Sarah, go for it. I'm just going to say, kind of in the interest of time, maybe I don't want to take up too much time from yeah, maybe, from maybe. Patrick and uh, his work. Uh, I just wanted to quickly just show you, kind of. Oh, this did something strange. Uh,
I mean, I, I mean, I could run through what I, what I have, and I'm really just really kind of talking about my work. I think that you've done a fantastic job in in drawing in some larger contexts, and then you know we can we can play, you know. So yeah, can I, I'm just going to take just like a minute um, just to kind of talk about something that I was working on, just to show you what I've sort of mm -hmm. done with this this AI, and mm -hmm. it's kind of related to what we're talking about with vulnerable populations. Um, but I've taken this technology specifically using gpt2 because of how it builds on prompts and precisely for its flaws uh, to apply this to kafka's the trial uh, which opens with uh joseph a being arrested and no, without knowing why and throughout the whole novel he doesn't know why uh, this novel was written in 1914 uh, and kafka ended up ultimately abandoning it in 1915 basically saying that it was unpublishable um, and he wanted his friend to destroy it when he died obviously um, but because the novel is unfinished, what I've done is essentially I've cut a lot of the novel. I've taken it down from like 90,000 words to like 25,000 words. Um, I put it into Twine um, and I've been using the AI to essentially um, fill in gaps in the novel and also create moments of choice. Um, and then depending on how many AI interactions you have, uh, that ultimately uh, leads to a different ending. Uh, so this is kind of just a map of, of the twine. Um, yeah, and so then I would have instances where, you know, you could choose to go speak with your neighbor, which is like what actually happens in the novel, or um, you can just, you know, kind of end your night, uh, and then it will, I use the AI to essentially like generate um, some of these moments uh, where he talks about, you know, I fed the line like he did not feel like going to bed, so he decided to stay up, um, and then it kind of fills that in, and then, you know, he quietly smokes a cigar until about 11, and then it kind of creates this whole like dream scenario, uh, which was really interesting. Uh, and I won't go into this in detail, just in the interest of time, but, uh, and then I had another scenario where it was like the men brought Kay to the judge and that was the prompt. And then it sort of follows up with, uh, Kay realized that the judge was not a man at all, but something else. So you can see again, this thing where it's trying to say that it was a man, but then also sort of subverting itself we just saw using the other the other platform uh, AI dungeon but yeah so then it just kind of generates all of this stuff and then kind of as a uh, I guess transition to Patrick's uh, presentation uh, some of the other things with the sort of adaptation some visual interest uh, I took passages from the original novel and then put them into I used Wombo uh, Wombo Dream uh, which was a Canadian uh, AI image generator, and I really like that it's very dreamlike and it doesn't look like um, And uh, yeah, so it you know it had this bit of text where it says um, Elsa was uh, the photograph was not one that had been taken while Elsa was posing for it. It showed her just after she had been in a wild dance, such as she liked to do in wine bars. Her skirt was still flung out. Uh, she span around. She placed her hands on her. She looked to one side with a laugh and you could not see uh, from the picture whom her laugh was intended for. And then the other person responds with, I don't like her, she's clumsy and crude, right? Which works so well with, um, obviously, the image that it's presented. Uh, and there were a lot of different instances like this. Like there's another uh, scene in the, the novel where uh, he goes to the courtroom, which is like weirdly held in someone's uh, apartment. Uh, and then he picks up this book while there's, you know, court is in reception. He finds these books that he wants to look through to see if he can find any um, information about his trial. And what he finds is uh, essentially someone had crudely drawn uh, like sex scenes or something in this book, right? There's these weird drawings that describe those. Um, and I said, you know, he's been so grossly lacking in skill that all anyone could make out were the man and woman who dominated the picture with their bodies sitting over the upright postures uh, that created a false sense of perspective and made it difficult for them to approach each other, right? So I just thought this AI kind of making these awful images like worked really well with the story that's kind of describing them in the same way. Um, but yeah, so that's essentially how I've been using this kind of text generation and also a little bit of image generation, but I think that will uh, transition well maybe to Patrick's presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it is online somewhere. I can share the link to that. It's just, I don't know if it's quite finished yet, but it's sort of finished. So if anyone wants that, I can. 
fantastic is that um in let's see here in in my case thank you sarah um and i'm i'm really glad that i'm really glad that you put so many things in in a much larger context than than i have i'm really kind of talking primarily about uh my my own um my own work and um basically what's what sort of brought me here and some of the uh, some of the methods behind um what's what's happening and a lot of the things that have been talked about i hope are somewhat implicit within um some of the methods that uh I'm, some of the methods that i'm doing um probably could have been a little bit more explicit um let's see here um so let's see here let's see if i can make sure that i can get the okay oh that's very that's uh huh evidently i might have let's see did i get rid of my well uh basically what i'm talking about is i'm trying to talk about how to how to how to how to break ai and um what my what my approach to this is comes from my uh interest in virtual narratology and um joseph frank's idea of 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 spatial theory and my work in in vr and narratology um so this is kind of my little bit of my epistemic arc um from virtual narratology to spatial form, um, BC Nickel and uh, vir virtual concretism. I've done a lot of work with um, what uh, exists yet of, uh, of fluxus. And um, in Ireland, um, I had a piece that was looking at, gra at gravity as a narratological structure. Um, and then um, one letters from Nagin, uh, two, uh, which was in Second Life, and then once again going to concrete prose, isolating and drilling, uh, iterating as a form of deep reading, and small differentiations as an initial condition. So um, very kind of uh, formalist. Um, and uh, but the thing is, is that there's a uh, uh, some of the methodology, some of the aspects of the methodology. In other words, if you see that there is um, that there are uh, very few quote subjects um, in my in my work it, it, it's that's very very intentional on a on a couple routes. I'll say that um, I I don't um, judge myself, but I, I had an ASD uh, diagnosis about four years ago, and so uh, I noticed that that may be um, a uh, one reason why. I ha I often have very few uh, subjects in my work, um, and then um, let's see here. And then you know, basically also another reason why I'm you know really kind of almost looking uh, a lot in in terms of form. Um, I'll just kind of go through just a quick arc of of some things that I did before. Um, so um, about seven eight years ago. Uh, I've been working in in VR and um, since 1998 when I started working in something called Superscape, and um, and uh, basically uh, first experienced um, VR from um, Char Davies and uh, and um, uh, Jaron Lanier in the early 90s. Um, so I've been interested in this um, for quite some time, but um, where things sort of tended to make sense from a um from an ELO and 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 narratological perspective is when I found uh the essay um let's see here the idea of spatial form by uh by Joseph Frank in which he uh talks about um certain authors like uh, like Proust and uh especially um uh let's see here Joyce and Dubliners and Eliot and the idea of of narratives that um take place in a very compressed amount of time in in a or in a very compressed uh notion of space 
And uh, to me, that made a great deal of, of sense. And it, it influenced um, for, let's see, ever since 2006, um, I was uh, a, a principal in a, a performance art group called Second Life, which was very interesting. Uh, we were a pretty diverse group of people. Um, we had, um, let's see here, uh, people from, uh, it was interesting. We had uh, uh, one artist from St. John's. We also had uh, Bibby Hansen, who was a uh, um, Fluxus artist, Al Hansen's uh, um, daughter, and a uh, whole bunch of different sorts. I think the uh, the other thing, a whole bunch of different sorts, and we were just a, a host of of aliens and non-humans and, and such who really looked at the idea of of what happened when you took performance and you either questioned the body or got rid of it and such and you know we were exploring this notion of affect but um in general what uh, what happened when i um started exploring this notion of of spatial form in uh in in virtual in virtual space um and this was when i was in arabia which in itself was very fraught um because of the no, notion of aniconism in, in Islam. And um, in the UAE, they weren't too bad about it. Um, in Saudi, um, there, there would have been a few more problems. But the idea of the uh, representation of something that could be, uh, uh, you know, a, a living body as uh, the, um, you know, as only uh, Allah can um, create life, you know. But the thing is, is that... Um, there were some interesting matters on the hundredth or hundredth uh, birthday of of the founder of the of, of the country, um, Sheikh Zayed um, Al Nayan. Uh, you know he had been gone, but what they did is that um, couple, uh, Alexa. Um, thank you. Um, anyway, um, you are so very welcome. Yikes. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, they created a, a, a recreation of him giving what this uh, uh, called the uh, the national speech. Um, and, um, you know, very realistic. And I asked my students, I, I was teaching all Arabic women. And I said, is there, um, you know, any issue with this? And they said, no, 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 professor, it's fine. We love Sheikh Zayed. And I said, okay. So uh, this piece actually was created for Manarat al-Zayed. Um, it was uh, uh, basically um, the Island of Happiness, the uh, cultural center in Abu Dhabi. It was uh, made for um, um, uh, basically to be running entirely through um, the month of Ramadan. It actually went all through the summer and basically your perspective, this was, this is the global perspective. You would go around and basically um, be part of a, um, uh, an Arabic part, an Arabic version of uh, the little prince um, in which you would um, encounter areas in which I had actually done architectural scans of, of different parts of architecture. Um, let's see here, encounter classic music and counter, uh, you know, parts of culture that, I had um, encountered and not necessarily appropriated, but represented through my own through my own lens uh, to kind of share with my Emirati friends, you know how I how I saw them as opposed to trying to uh, trying to speak for them. Um, so let's see here. Um, during this time, I had come in contact. Um, with uh, Justin Nicholson, uh, Justin Stevenson's movie BC Nickel, The Complete Works. And uh, this, there were a couple of scenes, um, one with um, Nichols, uh, you know, uh, Do Re Mi Fa So La Ti Do, you know, basically on a landscape and driving by it, which uh, shows up later in uh, Letters for Nagin, too. Um, but the thing is, is that this particular this particular scene of 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 nickel, you know, on a on a beach with these letters, you know, just hovering out in the middle of 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 everywhere. Um, 
basically to me, this was, you know, absolutely evocative as, as, as far as my wanting to look at, you know, my, the, the theories that I had in regards to uh, virtual narratology and spatial form. Um, this led to a piece where I could not find a picture of. Um, my um, my partner, Nagin, um, had done a uh, block Farsi version of my name. Uh, and what I had done is that I had taken it into the Unreal Engine, which is a game engine which is used for uh, Fortnite, um, which is fraught in itself. Um, so, but the thing is, is I thought that the idea of the affective qualities of, you know, what I was bringing into the space, you know, once again, you know, problematized the, the, the use of the, um, of uh, the space that I was in being that, you know, we're talking about the, the engine as uh, uh, on one hand being a, a warm affect versus a, a violent affect. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is that what I had done is I had taken the, the, the block Kufic Farsi that I was using as a space to navigate through and had various ramps to one that was um, up, I'd say scale about maybe 30 or 40 meters, but you would go up the ramp and halfway, the um, you would notice that there was a gap and gravity would reverse. And then, um, you know, looking at gravity as a, as a narratological structure, um so and then this brought me to i think this was uh uh 2020 um because of the fact that uh, we have been separated by uh, um geopolitical issues uh about half the time that uh um we've been together and so this is the the performance that i did for um ELO and the idea of the hassock um, being full of grass is that when someone is absent, they say that your chair is full of grass. And so basically during this uh, during this piece, um, I waited and, and discussed the situation while I was, uh, you know, looking at um, um, Nagin's hassock that was uh, full of grass. And you can see off to the right here, there's uh, Nichols' do re, do re, do re me piece. Um, so, um, this kind of brings me to, let's see here, earlier in the, earlier in the summer, um, started writing about, I'm, well, let's see here, actually about, no, 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 um, last fall, I started, uh, discussing this prompt-based work, and to me, actually, I think that, um, AI is far more about writing than it is about uh, than about the visuals, um, or at least I think that's much more interesting. I think somewhere between um, concrete prose and uh, and code poetry, and um, and that that brings forth a lot of questions. So this is kind of a diagram of the inside of one of these things. Um, when we look at the the, the structure of a uh, of a clip based ge uh, image generation system, uh, there's a you know a strict methodology and place, and one you know, realizes is you know, you can jump outside the box rather quickly. Um, so let's see here. Um, I'll maybe expand this a little bit more. Um, so I see a couple different places in here where. Um, you know, there are some pretty weak links. So, um, you know, the engine that basically uh, winds up taking uh, your prompt and uh, translates it into something what the engine is called the trans uh, is called the transformer. And then it says long range interactions here with where it learns. But then also, on the other hand, is that you have the images and then you have the uh, you have the neural net, which um, is interesting because of the fact that here we have a couple places in which we have um, these 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 spaces of interpretation and bias. You know, as I'm very interested in 
you know, Wendy Chun's work in um, in in the notion of uh, of, of platform bias and uh, you know how it has to do with um, you know race, gender, ability, and all these sorts of things, which we saw, of course, in the um, you know in the AI dungeon. And I think that um, by either deciding to, as we did, play or not, um, you know, uh, you know, raises contestational issues. Um, so let's see here. Um, so this, um, I, I, I did a piece for the um, Grand Exhibition of Prompts, the NetProv that uh, Rob Wittig and um, Mark Marino did. And um, let's see here. Um, it kind of you know, re reveals kind of the release of control of form to attempt this sort of uh, improvisational space within this given engine. So, uh, this is my this is my prompt. I said the grand exposition occupies the interior of a zeppelin high above the world. The walls lined with punch cards from old IBM mainframes. I don't know where I am. The grand exhibition of art swirls around me in a helix, uh, antique sketch, and hyper realistic. In this case, um, an, an important point is that the first time that um, I worked with this. This was with Mid Journey version three. Um, and um, I just regenerated this uh, a couple of days ago with Mid Journey version four. And of course, this is interesting in that we get something completely different. Um, I thought that um, what I got with version three was uh, far more crude, far more, um, you know, far less polished. And I thought, to me, this was much, much more, much, much more interesting. Um, and, you know, this is almost, you know, this nice kind of art deco, you know, WPA kind of uh, kind of piece. Uh, this brings me into uh, the work that I've been doing um, lately. And um, so what my theory is, you know, really, as I said about concrete prose, a little code po poetry, but the one thing that I've been doing and I think uh, Lyle mentioned this earlier, and and I, I I totally agree. I've I've been in order to try to look at what I'm thinking about the um almost the the subconscious, if you will, of of these systems. Um, um, I don't have a slide for this, but I'll go back and say one thing is is that I was working with uh, engines called. Uh, Gener uh, let's see here, generative adversarial networks in which uh, you know you're comparing different sets of uh, images and um, you know creating new ones from them. Um, I used um, something called Playform, uh, which is is very good for this. But um, from about 2017 through 2020, um, about every morning I would go and do a um, um, a um, um, a daily calligraphy um, in, because my second uh, language is Japanese. And um, so what happens is, is I would take these and I would take different sets of them and then, and then run them against each other to see whether I could find a pattern within them in the notion of Chomsky's ideas of deep structure because of the fact that I'm, I'm fascinated with my own um, you know, my, my own mental structure, um, for obvious reasons. So in, you know, in, in so being what I wanted to try to do is that I want in setting these sets of dailies against each other, I wanted to see whether I could find sets of commonality and therefore perhaps find a, um, 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 a, a Rorschach or, or a fingerprint of, of my subjectivity. Um, so, you know, and on one hand, that was completely generated from my own images. And then here we have images that are probably run from the Leon B, 5B uh, set, which a lot of these engines use. Um, and one thing I think is very interesting is that the Leon, uh, Leon company is... It says that it's nonprofit and profit at the same time. And um, you know, it's uh, a lot of these a lot of these companies that are involved with um, uh, these these particular new technologies are 
kind of talking out of the same side of their it, uh, out of both sides of their mouths and um and it's starting to catch up with them with as we can see with the lawsuits that are coming up um so what i wind up doing uh with my work um i try to avoid references to people figures animals landscapes architectures or anything uh, representational. This is an early, er, early piece of work um, that I did. Um, I have about twelve series of these, and they're all they're also animated. Um, but the way that I, I'm uh, something that I find is very interesting is that um, as I stay with one particular set of tropes, um, I'll keep running the results letting the engine train itself but on the uh, on the other hand so i see some of these that come up oh bless you is that um and then what i wind up doing is that i start then doing subtle variations on a couple a, a couple words here or there and then see what those uh those semantic differences um create so say for example um, I look at uh, iterating as a form of deep reading. Um, and so the thing is, is that small different differentiations, you know, create um, interesting, you know, um, you start with initial condition and then just, just basically just work with the small semantic differences. Uh, so say, for example, this actually comes out of um, about... Oh my God! Maybe, maybe about sixteen iter hundred iterations, with small tweaks of what you've seen in the previous two slides. And here I have um, I added the words Persian geometry, um, and that 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 changed uh, something a great deal. And I think um, I was very interested in seeing that that. Was interpreted also as the golden ratio. Um, so um, here we go. Small differentiations um, as far as it um, initial conditions. So um, there's about three or four different projects I'm involved in. I'm um, creating a book called um, "In the Posthuman Studio" um, based on images that I created of artist studios, um, supposedly AI artists, you know, and nobody in there, and then actually generating artist statements with GPT-3. And um, I'm just kind of wondering, it's, I've done, let's see, it's uh, the book that I'm creating is uh, 50 artists, 50 AI artists, and uh, with their, um, with their statements. And the, the thing that I'm wondering about is that I'm wondering about whether I should have the curator statement be um, generated by GPT-3 as well as, uh, as a critical statement as to whether um, there's the potential for, given these technologies, really in a sense of um, creativity, create, making, the, making the human uh, participant or non-participant um, purely a spectator. Um, so this is actually another project that I'm uh, doing called the uh, the Museum of Speculative Computing. Um, so in this case, this is exactly the same prompt. In other words, this is a this is um, a computer designed in the style of Calatrava. Uh, I used to work in a um, um, in a um, architecture school in in the UAE. But the thing is, is that the difference is, as I said, one is ancient and one is, is vintage. And can anybody guess which is which? So I'm betting I'm that the, yeah, yeah the two, two can harm, the Tutankhamen one, the, the Egyptian looking one on the right is it's ancient. ancient. It's probably, yeah, exactly. And and then, and I, I'm saying this rather facetiously, but um, every once in a while, um, 
I I let my pre preconceptions go. I if anybody is I'm 60 and um I remember that I used to listen to Robin Williams album Reality What a Concept, you know, just endlessly. And I remember him saying, "Hey, how about that pa uh, Babylon uh, Babylon Babylonian Tupperware?" And that's stuck in my head all these years and I said, "Hey, let's put that in there." And this is what I got and I I'm reserving, um, I'm reserving judgment on this. Um, uh, I, th I think it's what, at, at the same time, it's interesting, but it's problematic. And so, um, you know, the, the idea that it's, it's confusing and satisfying. Um, but on the other hand, I also feel that these, these, these systems are highly manipulative um because you know it's in it's in the system's best interest to give us something that we find satisfying and then that brings us back to refine something you know, refine you know basically give it a heuristic that then creates the cybernetic loop that that basically brings us to something that um you know, uh, I'd say us as a plurality into something that that supposedly want to see. But the thing is, is that, of course, we know that you know there are a, there are biases and flaws inherent in the system that this may or may not um, happen. Uh, so, say for example, I'm involved in a and in a putting together an AI sh a couple AI shows, and there are people who I think are doing amazing work, like uh, Natrice Gaskins. Um, I've, I've been asking, I was, um, a friend of mine, uh, Nathan Schaefer is working with uh, Northwest uh, Indigenous Peoples. I just put out a, um, uh, a query to uh, Skowinati and um, I'm trying to think, and also Stephanie Dinkins uh, and uh, Morshin Aliari, who's, uh, um, I first collaborated with my partner through and, um, you know, just the idea of all these different, um, you know, diverse, uh, you know, peoples trying to see, you know, what they're doing to try to, uh, you know, kind of challenge the impl implicit and explicit agendas within these, these, these particular, um, you know, these particular pieces. And I'm thinking here is that, and then of course, what about GPT-3? Um, the interesting thing is that there's actually a, a, a little, um, I've been talking with, uh, of course, some of my uh, colleagues here locally, um, Scott Retberg and that sort of thing, talking about, um, you know, uh, coding using GPT-3 and, and actually um, I've been starting to create some, some plotter art um, using um, code for processing that's been generating. But when I think about uh, you know um, generating code, I'm uh, generating prompts for uh, GPT three. Uh, looks like completely abandoning any form of human agency. It makes some sense when one's considering you know um, you know taking these engines and maybe putting them in in some sort of adversarial relationship. So this is I, I asked for a prompt about uh, talking about. Um, um, uh, talking about these things, it's it said, okay, uh, imagine a professor, and I took out imagine because that's the that's the beginning of a prompt for uh, mid journey. Um, a professor standing in front of a whiteboard, a white professor in front of a white male professor in front of a, 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 a whiteboard uh, with a virtual reality headset on their head. They're discussing the um, intersection of virtual reality and concrete poetry using examples from the virtual world to illustrate the concepts they're teaching. And I think, to me, I think it's a little bit funny that the, um, that the, that the headset is technically obscuring their vision. So uh, giving, a, uh, giving an implication of blindness. Um, so, and this is uh, one point when I keyed in, um, what, what is it, uh, experiments with Kafka. Um, so I think it's interesting we can consider 
what uh, those of you, you know, the audience are doing or, or an interest in this and where Sarah is uh, going with her work with, with Kafka and can feed into the image space and then maybe create some novel results. So um, I said, this is, you know, very much more, much more about my own personal arc over the last uh, seven or uh, uh, seven or eight years. And, um, and um, I kind of give this back to the floor and I thank you for your, your uh, patience and consideration for, for my, um, for this discussion. And um, Sarah, uh, Sarah, what were, um, what do you think maybe we could go from here, you know? Uh, does, let's hear, do, do we, do we only have seven minutes left? Seven minutes. Yep. What can you do in seven minutes? So, um, Sarah, is anything that you'd like to do? I mean, I have a couple ideas, but, um, yeah. Why you know. don't we do more of like the visual stuff since we did? Oh, okay. Then, um, well, some of that. let's, uh, I, I have, so this is something that's, um, Kind of interesting. The one thing I also want to talk about is that there's so many engines these days. Um, I went to the uh, Stable Diffusion um, online conference. They kind of had an unconference uh, about uh, a month ago. Uh, and what's happening is unbelievable. I mean, some of the workflows that uh, some of the um, quote artists are doing, um, you know, they're using about six or seven different packages and going back and forth and using them to, to work at, work out, um, um, you know, redrawing parts and reposing and, um, and all this. And the one thing that I'll mention briefly that I, um, um, of course, we know that they're, um, in stable diffusion, there are there are content gu guide rails as there are in Midjourney and and many many others and um, of course there are many engines that do not have content guide rails and this is very much a um, um, very much an ethical uh, dilemma as far as I'm concerned because of the fact that um, you know with with Lenza uh, which is um, the um, uh, portrait generating app that uh, basically got me interested in doing an, an exhibition of this work, which I hope will be ready for CAA um, in, uh, in, in February. The idea that the images that you create with this go back into, I think maybe the Leon uh, 5B um, uh, database, which could potentially be used for inappropriate content. And, um, you know, you can write them and tell them to, you know, take your images out. But once again, there's, you know, is there any guarantee that they're going to do it? It's sort of like an unsubscribe from a spam. Um, you know, are they going to, are they actually going to do these things? Um, let's see here. Actually, I think maybe at, at maybe just as a little provocation, um, maybe we can have a little discussion and then, um, does anybody want to, uh, suggest a prompt that, uh, could, um, you know, uh, possibly, uh, you know, question some of the biases, you know, of the, uh, uh, of, of the system. And, um, you know, we could, we could interrogate this thing a little bit. Um, just, if you put in like best scientist or something, mm -hmm. that would be an interesting or best mathematician. Um, I'm betting that you're going to get a white man. I would agree. I would oh. bet that almost any profession you put in, you're going to get a white man. Yeah, I pretty would. much. And if you put in crime, you're going to get a black man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see here. To so try um, that. Yeah. Let's see here. Okay. Um, uh, the. Yeah. And with this, I do want to talk 
just really briefly, it's in mid, especially because I'm writing a book, um, self-care and world care in uncertain times. And I've sure. got about a hundred images that I want from the AI that I've done. And mid journey says it's copyright free and I'm gonna go with that, but uh, I mean, for my personal, I'm not a good artist. I don't have the coordination. But, right. um, you know, I, I also, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without AI, but I'm kind of worried about it. Yep, and you're right, right as you see on your screen. <laughs> yep. oh, I love that it's the Joker that comes up for heinous criminal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and possibly Jack the Ripper. Mm hmm. Down syndrome professor. Pardon? Oh, yeah. Try for professor. Down mm. syndrome professor. Oh, my oh. Lord. Yeah. And it is interesting that we've just gotten men as well. Um, so there's there's so many biases on gender, language, Victorian age. Yeah, there's a lot. And yeah. Also, I've noticed when I do concepts, it's almost all women. So if I say mm -hmm. patience, it's all women or something. It, so it's it's an odd mix. Anytime that you say something very abstract in mid journey, you'll get the picture of a beautiful woman. God knows why. Mm -hmm. And then uh, let's see here. Um, let's let's think yeah. about that. Um, let's see here. Um, celebrated yeah. female um, computer science professor let's really stick it to this thing so this is going to be our last prompt i think so that we can make sure that uh yes. francie has her time to talk about uh spider hand um let's just see this last prompt let me get spider hand up Yeah. Yeah. All white. wearing glasses. Yep. Oh, white yep. glasses. Yep. White with glasses. Hi. All right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you both to uh Patrick and Sarah. I think we've we've seen a lot of the the uh bias, but a lot of the capabilities that um uh, ai and prompt generators and text generators and chats um sarah's posted a gpt detector um which is interesting and we put all the links uh hopefully we captured them all into the uh miro board uh and now we are going to transition to uh, yes, round of applause for Patrick and Sarah. Yay. Excellent work. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, and next up is Francie Grayling with uh, her artist talk on a Biter Hand, uh, which is Biter Hand Karoo Garden Poems. Apologies that I shorthanded that. Um, a Braille Trail Accessibility and Locative Literature. So I've been familiar with this for a little while and I'm excited to, to hear more about it. I think we co-presented on a panel a couple of years ago, so I got to hear about it and, and it's great to have Francie to, here to talk about it again. So take it away, Francie. Uh, thanks, Lil. Um, as you've said, uh, some of you are, are familiar with our Locative Literature Project. Uh, my, my focus or my my um, idea is the infinite possibilities of locative literature in public gardens um, with, with um, some examples of our project then. 
Um, so, so our more recent installation is part of a new Braille trail in the Karwe Desert National Botanical Gardens in the Western Cape. The project is the culmination and the embodiment of our journey with locative literature over the past seven years and demonstrates how the principles and design solutions developed in the, this experimental and creative environment have the potential for broader applications for the benefit of many. And uh, my, my presentation is in the form of a video discussing the poetry installations in four gardens. Each of these contexts have brought unique challenges, possibilities and experiences and contributed to the development of the, of the project and accessible design solutions. Uh, and in the video, Baderand Garden Poems focused on pathways and walking are discussed in relation to the uh, core principles of the project, such as creativity, collaboration, co-creation, inclusivity and accessibility. And, and this is the first um, longer video that I made, actually, uh, you can call it my first video. So um, it is handmade, <laughs> self-made, uh, combined with images and videos uh, of others as well. Um, so I just want to make sure that I share the screen and as also enable you to listen, to hear it. What should I do? Uh, Lyle, uh, can you share sound? Okay, I'm trying that. Um, Got it? No, no, I just want to make sure that. Yep. Can you, can you hear? Can. Yes, I can hear. Okay. Yes. I can't see the video yet. Welcome to the Botanical Garden of the Northwest University Francie. in Puchestown, South Africa. We Among the many it, experiences that the garden uh, offers sorry, to visitors so, um, is the Baderand uh, Garden Poems. Sorry, it's, it's a, a problem. Look. Yeah, I think you need to share your desktop. When you share from Zoom, share your yeah. desktop uh, and sorry. not the individual <laughs> sorry, video. Sorry. Uh, uh, I just want to stop something. Um, sorry. Um, uh, so when you click on uh, share. Okay. Can you, uh, okay, let's start again. Uh, that is what was, I was asking. How should I share it? I'm not familiar yeah. with so When you click share screen, it's going to pop up a window with all of the different windows from your computer that you can share. Okay. But you want to select the one that says desktop. Uh, okay. No, I don't have one uh, for desktop, only for, for screen. It should be the, the very first one up, up top left. Okay. It should be highlighted by default. Okay. And then make sure you click the checkbox to share sound. Uh, where should I click that? Uh, that was back back on the same screen. See if it see if it works. Double click your play your video and see if it works. Yep, you got it. Great. Thanks. Welcome to the Botanical Garden of the Northwest University in Pochestrum, South Africa. Among the many experiences that the garden offers to visitors is the Baderand Garden Poems, a locative literature installation by the Department of Creative Writing. The multimodal installation comprises a collection of standalone poems accompanied by voice recordings translations, animations, musical arrangements, and even physical artwork. Please join me in the garden while I tell more about the project and reflect on the interaction between walking experiences and the co-creation of local.